Good afternoon for all of you. It's a, it's a great day to, to have uh, this meeting again. Um, my name is Marcio Galeato. I, I am one of the co-directors of mhpasses.net, uh, uh, which is a, an organization that is, uh, um, has the honor to be helping just uh, in a very small role, facilitating a very beautiful initiative, uh, which is called the Community of Practice in the Caribbean region. So this initiative started a, a, a a uh, few years ago, it's growing in a in a in a very locally based contextual uh, focus in the Caribbean regions, with uh, the countries and organizations and the people on the ground being the driver's seat of this initiative, an initiative that aims at just connecting people uh, that works under the mental health and psychosocial support uh, umbrella work, you know, which is beyond the traditional mental health in order to reflect about its own challenge, uh, but also share uh, the number of lessons, real-time lessons, and be a forum where we can support each other. Uh, so very welcome uh, to today's meeting. I, this is the second meeting of this year. Um, uh, in a sequence of meetings, that thematic meetings we are gonna have this year. Um, and now I pass over to my colleague, uh, uh, Michelle Blake, who will uh, welcome you as well and uh, introduce the topic of the day today. Hello, thank you, Marcio. Hi, uh, let me add my words of welcome to everybody who is uh, joining us today. You know, we have many people from the Caribbean region and we also have our partners from different agencies throughout the world. So we are just happy to have everybody here today. I just want to add my reminder to what Matthew said as we go along. I know a few more people have come in. Um, just go ahead and add your, your name and your welcome in the chat so that we can see who we have here. And we'll be um, able to, to hear from you as we go through later. So just say hello to everybody. Uh, we are going to spend a few minutes just getting a little bit of an update from uh, Valeria about MHPSS and COP. And then we are going to go into the meat of the matter. We're going to have our uh, presenter here today, Davide. And then we're going to have some Q&A. Then we're going to wrap up. So I'm going to ask Valeria to give you a little bit of update on the COP, the community of practice, and we'll go from there. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Valeria. Thank you, Michelle. Just to be up this to say is that our um, newsletter is coming. We're going to have a monthly newsletter as a community of practice. We're going to make it thematic if possible. And uh, we would like to ask you if there are any events in the region, in the Caribbean region that they are coming in April, please share them with us or even in the exit survey um, for us to include it. And we will also be sharing the link in the chat for you to register. And that we also have um, the recording ready of our last meeting that we will also be sharing in the chat, the link in case you couldn't join. Thank you. Okay, Valeria, thank you very much for giving us that update. So, um, you know, as, as you indicated, the chat would be the, the place that you populate the, the information. And so people could, at, you know, there at the end of this, I think people could go to the chat and make sure that they check out all of these links. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. So this afternoon, we are going to get right into the meat of the matter. Now we're here from all over the world to be able to talk about issues related to mental health and psychosocial support. And we're pleased to have with us today a presenter who's gonna spend a few minutes talking about something that is relevant to all of us. I know we here in the Caribbean are very much aware of, of climate and the impact of climate change on disasters and of course the impact of, on us as human beings. But we know that throughout the world, people experience uh, disasters and, and climate related disasters. Um, so what Davide is going to talk to us about here is very relevant. So we have with us today, uh, Dr. Davide Ziveri, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, who is a social psychologist by training. And he's a social psychologist with 15 years uh, experience in the field. Um, the field, especially the field of human rights. So I think Davide, I'll call you Davide if you don't mind, is currently working on environmental and social determinants of health and mental health. 
Um, so today specifically, he is going to talk to us about disaster risk reduction and climate crisis, a conversation with Caribbean region MHPSS, uh, COP, Community of Practice. So we are all anxious to hear what Davide has to say. I know the time is going to go quickly, so I'm going to turn right over to you, Davide, to carry us through this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I just had that um, uh, for you to know, I'm uh, currently work uh, with the United and Inclusion NGO and I'm based in, uh, in Brussels, but uh, I, the, my organization works in more than 60 countries, not all of them with the DRR and, and the mental health project, but is of course something that uh, we want to develop. And I'm here more than nothing to share and not to teach for sure, but to share food for thoughts. And what uh, uh, I met moving around the global uh, mental health discourse. But then it's very important that we use the Q&A time for questions for sure, I'm not sure to having answer, but more for, criti for your critical comments to understand how the suggestion I'm going to share can resonate or not, can make sense or not in your own community and in your work. So I'm very curious. To, to arrive to that part to, to listen from you. I'm going to share the screen for this fourth step. Um, let's do it just one second as usual. So I hope that now it works. Yes, so I can see. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I tried to do it wider. Yeah, so just sharing some thoughts about this uh, complex uh, topic. The idea today is to uh, focus on the impact of, of climate change and environmental degradation, I prefer to say biosphere degradation um, on mental health and well-being from the perspective of planetary health. And we we'll see maybe uh, some of you or even many of you have already crossed this framework uh, for others could sound something new. Let's, uh, let's see, I think that it could be really valuable for uh, guiding us through this journey. And I just started with this image because I think that hearts really play a, a positive role in helping us to understand and to understand not only what happens out there, but also to understand our emotion, of course. Uh, and then we share, of course, the I guess the, the, um, the slides and in the notes, you have all the references and quotes. So of course, uh, so let's do that. I hope that now you see better. Um, so of course, change is bigger than visible disaster and it is complex. That's why we need a vision behind that. And this vision, I mean, the one that I want to propose today is the planetary health framework. The planetary health that is born in the emerging field in, uh, in global health, emerging in 2015 by the Rockefeller Foundation and just stating that the health of human civilization and the natural system on which it depends. That means that the health is something even more complex than uh, what we are used to, we'll see in a minute. The planetary health uh, idea, the starting point is that we're living in the Anthropocene. So in a epoch, in a geological epoch, where the human uh, footprint on, on our environment at all levels have shaped uh, uh, the change that we are living and that we are facing, starting from the climate change. But it's important to go through those images, especially now I'm on the on the bottom on the left, uh, because climate change um, um, sometimes sounds like a label, but it is of course nothing new. Is not the only process, right? Um, or the only phenomenon, and all those phenomena are, are interrelated. That's why I find really inspiring to refer to the planetary boundaries framework, this scheme here that uh, shows us how the, um, the vital system of Earth, of the Earth, have, have uh, been bypassed by overcome by, by human activities. And now we are really entered in a, in a certain zones because uh, according to science, we have, uh, we are broken those limits. That is an important point, not just for climate, but also for the use of plastic, for example, for the use of phosphorus and nitrogens, et cetera, for the loss of biosphere, as we know. And if we move in, on, on, the, on the right on the top, uh, 
you know that is very small but don't worry just to give an idea and then again you can uh, go through the references if you want um the point is that in the last uh, 70 years globally with a lot of inequities we know but globally we gain a lot in health right uh, for instance in life expectancy but we did it at the expensive of the uh, ecosystem services that means that uh, we 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 burn the house to to find some heat somehow so that's why the current model of health the current vision of health it's not sustainable anymore and that's why plan and that's where planetary health plays a role in helping us to rethink about some uh, basic assumption about what health is and we don't not have to forget of course that uh, uh, that health inequities are actually mirroring the uh, climate inequities and we know that uh, the uh, if we measure wealth global wealth the bottom 50 percent of global population experiencing now and in the close future uh, the majority of relative losses are those uh, that less contribute to emission and vice versa that it means that planetary health also include the concept of uh, social justice and it's not just about uh, uh, biochemical uh, aspect um, this slide is just to remind us uh, really related to to planetary health too that uh, uh, we can uh, uh, enlarge our focus and not just to focus only on severe weather and uh, and the direct impact uh, on health and mental health but also on other uh, changing aspects of health that are very complex and interrelated, but I'm moving faster. Um, one important thing is really to, to close this very short uh, present, presentation or let's say planetary health in a nutshell, is that uh, planetary health push us to zoom out from the disease that are actually the health outcomes in this scheme on the extreme right there uh, of the slide, because actually are of course shaped by culture by governance etc but, but by what the global health studies but also by environmental health also at global level so the planetary health tr try to really take a snapshot of those of those pathways that are very complex um, and of course are not linear but just to remind us that uh, our health is something bigger and we cannot avoid if we want really to reach health prevention to focus also on the root causes or upstream factors right so is one of the many insights and inputs from from uh, planetary health and then we come to, to to mental health and the link is very easy because uh, climate crisis is health crisis and uh, is uh, WHO say that um, and uh, we know also now is a, is a quite used in our community professional communities that there is no health without mental health so logically MHPSS facing climate crisis matters and matters because science says that and I really don't spend time on those slides I just try to collect it, uh, the the most recent few, uh, few um, among the most recent uh, evidences uh, I think that uh, um, we need time after this meeting to go through it because uh, uh, we sometimes we focus only on on some aspects and general distress etc but of, but there are many different pathways um, and um, and we can relate it those with uh, with disaster but as i said before um, there are also the slow onset uh, uh, changes that are very important again because uh, when we, we think about DRR we are often um, focusing on uh, catastrophe disasters and then when we pass to, to the mental health on depression anxiety or post-traumatic stress disorder uh, it's one way of, of looking at the problem and for sure it's true but it's not the full story right so it's very important also to think about other concepts and it's exactly my main message today uh, but before that uh, just uh, remind us uh, that um, of course uh, um, there is also some positive aspect and and research maybe is not focused on those too much actually this uh, uh, the list uh, the, the bullet point are, are really less but 
uh, we also know that there are positive influences. And at the end of the day, climate solution benefit mental health. And again, is one of the core pillars of planetary health, the fact that uh, uh, environmental and health are, are really interwined and uh, uh, a planetary health activities, let's say, or program uh, aims the co-benefit for health slash mental health and the environment, because at the end, they are, let's say, synonyms. So the, one of the core concepts here, really, it's the most important uh, things I think we can discuss about together. Um, uh, one of the main concepts that we appear in here and there more and more is the concept of eco-anxiety. Um, eco-anxiety, uh, so the response, the emotional and behavioral response to the ecological doom. I honestly uh, a bit skeptical about the eco-anxiety use of so the use of this uh, of this label of this concept, not about the experience that of course is is a reality and many. Uh, of us and many of our uh, beneficiaries and clients uh, can uh, have some benefit in recognizing themselves un under uh, under that because they can find the award for what they're experiencing. And some others, they use another term very similar, but is a new one, um, as a neologism, so nostalgia that I'm sure you also heard about that. So the, this idea a bit more nuanced about uh, how our context is changing in a distressing way, how our environment is changing and we feel that something strange uh, and new even in our own home and, and communities. Eco-anxiety uh, is an interesting concept, uh, um, by the way, because it allows us to go beyond the concept of trauma and so to, to, to see also other aspects. And it's, uh, it's quite inviting uh, for projects and for donors, for example, because it could be miserable. But there are also some things, to, uh, some things to be taken into account. First of all, this is a normal and adaptive reaction. So we have, even if it's not a diagnostic category, we really need to pay attention to not using a, in a stigmatizing way. Um, and then eco-anxiety may divert attention from structural issues because eco-anxiety is mainly about what happens at individual level. Uh, but again, it's only one part of, of the story. And it can uh, also divert attention from other form of experiencing distress because uh, it could be uh, culturally uh, different, of course. Um, and the evidences so far about eco-anxiety concept and reality comes from research mainly in the Western countries. So I think that it could be a useful tool, but it could be problematized. But going uh, a, a bit faster, um, there are other concepts that we can put on the table. The first one is planetary well-being. The idea that uh, we value also non-human uh, uh, being and ecosystem. So the idea that well-being is not just related to human individual satisfaction of needs and values, but also about the non-human. It's something that is, of course, more common among uh, indigenous uh, knowledge and communities, um, and not, of course, uh, a mainstream concept in, a, in the Western way of thinking. Uh, but it's something that uh, uh, it could be very useful if, as a goal, if we want to work on mental health and well-being. Another concept really related is not a pathway. Yeah? This give me just to put all the elements on the table. Another element related to that is the ecological grief. Is another concept that I find it honestly much more useful to to describe what happened in terms of mental health. So the fact that we feel the pain for the loss of what we value, of the macro, even uh, when it's far away, like the, the loss of, uh, of biodiversity in another part of the world. But then, uh, uh, usually, we react to grief with action. But action is very limited. And agency sometimes is very limited. That's why I say that we cannot stop it at the individual level, because uh, the individual agency is often um, may may um, uh, meet many barriers um, and we can feel unable to recovery and to go through the ecological grief because we are stuck under structural violence because at the end of the day 
uh, climate change, as I said, is related to social justice and also is a matter of political violence and structural violence, right? Against uh, some population especially, but also against, as again, non-human and ecosystem. And only if we put moral injury on the, in the range, in the toolbox of MHPSS uh, uh, programs and, and teams, we can also we can proceed and coming back to and promote planetary well-being, and 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 it's where we really need to speak about hope and engagement. Not hope in a term like in a utopistic uh, utopian view of the future, but hope um, as a as a motivational um, concept, really to find the pathway to realize what we need and what we want for the future. Uh, but what we want the on the, for the future also depends on our vision. That's why I think that MHPSS, we we'll see in a moment, um, also can contribute to the storytelling about what climate change really is and how it can be perceived. And, and so to create and, 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 uh, and disseminate this vision about planetary well-being. So I think that uh, uh, those concepts, among many others for sure, are, are much more useful and impactful and are part of the MHPSS, uh, let's say, range or, or field and toolbox. Uh, I'm just uh, going through those slides that are uh, developing this, the, what I just said. Uh, then there is one important point, of course, is about target population. I mean, of course, uh, it's ab about all of us and everyone, uh, but for sure, because inequities, as I said, both health inequities and uh, climate inequities, um, there are some group of people that may uh, find uh, additional barrier, for example, in assessing resources, or in coping with disaster or in anticipating that, et cetera. And I'm thinking about, of course, persons with disabilities, uh, also um, adolescents and children. And there are studies that uh, shows how adolescents, of course, are um, uh, touched and affected by what is happened and this narration, but indigenous uh, people, uh, native nation, as I as I said before, because in addition to to direct threat, there is also uh, this um, impact um, about uh, their land and water rights, about the ways of life, the tradition, and so the identities, and uh, women and girls in many cases, uh, because there are more and more studies showing the uh, correlation with uh, the risk of violence. So, of course, it's impossible to, to, to just to have in boxes, but to adopt an intersectionality lens, yes, it's possible. And, uh, and navigating intersectionality, let's say, throughout active listening, first of all, and to understand what climate change means uh, for a specific group or for a specific person in, in their context. Then MHPSS uh, could uh, really be part of both mitigation and adaptation. Um, at least in the NGO world, um, we are, uh, or in, also for humanitarian actors, we often think that disaster risk reduction, and so the role that MHPSS can play there in adaptation, and it's true, we'll see in, uh, in the next slide, but it also plays a, a role in, uh, in uh, social change, so in mitigation, and mitigation pass through the social change, right, especially among emitters. MHPSS in DRR, uh, of course, it's a complex activity. I don't think in my understanding that uh, it exists now a sort of handbook about that, but there are many resources, uh, but not one way of doing. What is important to remind, I think that MHPSS can play a role in every phase, in prevention for sure, and first of all, understanding in advance what climate change means in a given community and not just taking for granted, uh, in preparedness, for example, in uh, with preparedness planning, MHPSS services and facilities, or basic uh, MHPSS training like PFA, etc., in the response, because of course we cannot miss uh, MHPSS uh, assessment of need, for example, in, uh, in the response, but also in the recovery, then working with groups, for example, and communities on hope and future and restoring uh, social cohesion and community ties. 
But then, as I said, MHPSS for social change is really the other side of the coin. And it means working on uh, collective emotion as, social, as ecological grief, as we said before. It means uh, fostering community resilience or fostering mutual aid. It means uh, uh, support communities and youth in mobilization. And also it, it means uh, work for social justice. It's not out of the MHPSS. Uh, uh, on the contrary, I think is really at the core of that. And there are many ways. Um, I mean, as NGOs, for example, we are engaged in advocacy, but there are so, so many, many ways. One thing that I want uh, to suggest is also to promote the use of disaggregated data for gender, age, and disability to show inequities that are so often simply hidden and so not taking account then in the policies or in the programs. So coming to the conclusion, what is our role as MHPSS, uh, specialized and not specialized at uh, all level of the YAS pyramid? I think that we have a big role to play, first of all, because we work on perception. So for example, on perceived risk, we work on experience and the reaction. So, and we also work on identities, on social norm, on relationship. And this is something that uh, generally speaking, in my experience at least, uh, is often uh, uh, neglected, at least by NGOs, maybe because the the nature of, of the intervention, but it's something that we, we cannot avoid, uh, especially if we have the possibility to work on long term. And what we can do in concrete, I mean, many things for sure, and I'm actually uh, really keen to hear from you, but um, let's say for let's say something, for example, like promoting recognition with nature, that is a sort of social prescribing, um, really working, and there are more and more evidence, but especially creating safe spaces to explore the difficult emotional reactions, having visible leadership in influencing our communities, professional communities, and our communities in general. Of course, as we said before, to protect vulnerable, vulnerable communities, and even before protecting to, to look at them and inviting them uh, to meaningful participation in climate and mental health uh, policies and programs uh, since the early design, if possible. Um, and then, again, because our goal of social change for planetary well-being to transform despair into care and action. And I think that in... Uh, uh, Central Latin American, there is in terms uh, of, of psychology history, uh, some uh, amazing experiences in the past, in the 70s and the 80s with the psychology of liberation, for example, or community psychology that really taught us a lot. And we can really come back to what we learned at that moment now for climate change. To do that, we uh, can more and more, and it's my last slide to recognize climate and environmental stressor because it could be one of course among many other stressor according to the situation that people and community are living um, and also again acknowledging the diversity of perspective and experiences and they mention it because the one of the risk of adopting some global mental health approaches like or, or, or concept like eco anxiety is that to are more, is to standardize the experiences and of course uh, I think that as humanity we are facing something new even if each generation in the past historically faced a, a sort of end of the world at that moment we have really reason unfortunately to think that this time is even worse and different that's why we cannot say that uh, no we don't know. So we really need to navigate that uncertainty. And another important point is to accepting our own powerlessness. It's not uh, the role of psychologists or, or MHPSS team to uh, offering solution, because in this case, we don't have, and our uh, even as professional, uh, we have to recognize and to acknowledge how limited is our action, but it, of course it's not a good reason to not do it, but we, it's important to accept that and the negative emotion of, of on, on ourselves and uh, our professional community to the ability to work with non-health and non-mental health sector, because as I said at the beginning, by definition is a transdisciplinary uh, endeavor. And finally, and again, moving beyond a focus on individual choices that is part 
of, of the problem and probably part of the solution, but we cannot underestimate the systemic and structural effect. So the, let's say the social and environmental determinants of health. I'm stopping here. I hope it was clear enough and I'm really keen to uh, interact and to discuss. Thanks. Okay, okay, Davide. Thank you so much for that. That was rich. I think I could listen to you all afternoon. There's so many things that I learned. And I know we're gonna get right into our question and answer and, and our community and our conversations. I think that's what you want. But I, I think you know there are things that would have resonated with people as they listen. Uh, just for me, um, there's some things that you said that really stuck. You know, the, you talked about the fact that majority of losses uh, as it relates to planetary issues are suffered by a lot of the people who are not contributing most to emissions. And you know that that resonates for a lot with us in the Caribbean region. We suffer hurricanes and we we know the full effect. Um, you, you talked about, and it's something we in mental health do, the positive uh, influence of nature on health. And we, of course, encourage people um, to take health as a part of our nature, as a part of their overall health. And so you sort of highlighted that. You introduced a concept, eco-anxiety, that um, it's, it's something that I want to hear more about, and I will, you know, I'm challenging myself to explore more of that. And then something else you talked about, just normalizing the adaptive reactions that we as human beings and our clients have to some of the things going on around them. So there is a lot that came from you. I know that in the question and answer and the, the conversation period, you'll hear some, we'll hear some more about what people were impacted by in your discussion. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over right now to Alicia St. Just, who is going to field some of the questions that we started getting in the chat. And I would encourage people to continue to put your questions there. If we can't get to them, then hopefully we could get to them in another format. Um, but certainly put the questions in the chat. So Alicia. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Our first um, question is from Jan Kress. It says, is there any reliable data available on the rise of, co of eco anxiety or related concepts? Um, David? Yep. Thanks. It's, it's, um, it's a very good question. Uh, I don't have those data. I know that they exist. Uh, I participate in, uh, I followed the different uh, webinars about, uh, about uh, eco anxiety, and there are more and more studies about that, despite the research gap so far. Um, but then, what is not yet clear is uh, um, how much meaningful is the concept of eco anxiety across cultures, for example. Uh, and then another another um, thing to take into consideration about uh, uh, before uh, uh, looking at the uh, at the epidemiology of eco anxiety is that uh, how it is defined because it's really a quite uh, recent concept and uh, uh, even if there are some um, scales that I, I quoted in the in the slides then uh, maybe we are measuring something different. And again, that it is not maybe this, the 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 um, what is experiences the stress as it as it is experiences in other in specific context by specific population. So I'm very very personally I'm very very careful to to look at the eco anxiety um, epidemiology. Uh, but still, as I said, is 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 an interesting concept, and maybe is what we have right now to to start speaking about that. Um, uh, so it could be a starting point, but really to be adapted to each context and to be critically discussed, because there are so many risks in taking it as granted as, as something that is exists out there as, a, as an object. It's, uh, it's, it's more or less like what happened with the, the PTSD uh, like 20 or more years ago, uh, yeah, probably more. Um, especially in the humanitarian field. Uh, of course, trauma exists and it's dramatic, but it's not the only outcome. And then if we narrow our focus on one concept uh, becoming mainstream, uh, there are so many risks of, of misunderstanding, I think. Oh, thank you. We have a, Rene wants to know if the slides are copyrighted and if he can use them in a presentation. Yeah, for sure, there is there is no problem. Uh, um, actually, in those slides, 
uh, uh, all all the references are in the in the notes that you did, didn't see in the presentation, but you have it in, in, on the file. So just make sure to refer to the exactly uh, quote. And uh, even better, of course, you, instead of quoting the the slides, you're going directly, of course, to the source that are quoted in the slides. Okay. Um, Colleen Braffitt has a hand up. You can go ahead, Colleen. Hi, good afternoon. I just have a quick question. Um, specifically, what you just mentioned about the eco anxiety, what cultures or what territories did you come across this concept amongst what kinds of people or geographic situations did you come across the concept? Yeah, now, as, as I said at the beginning, the premise, uh, where I saw it is in the, let's say, global mental health discourse. That means global mental health working group, networks, research, and um, and, and articles on, on uh, scientific journals, right? But, um, but then very rarely uh, um, from the own community as a sort as a self uh, identification concept and uh, and um, few studies in my knowledge uh, uh, in the low and middle income countries uh, but also because is 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 probably because eco anxiety is really like a snapshot at one moment of a video if you have one hour video and you take one picture of that uh, you have just it's so partial that that you don't have the, the full picture, right? And I think is what it, it happens with with the eco anxiety. Uh, then, for example, uh, the study that I mentioned uh, very fast about about um, uh, the experience and understanding and emotion uh, of youth uh, regarding uh, regarding climate change has been done in ten different countries, if I remember well. So it's quite interesting because at least we have a comparison among countries, etc. But um, but still, I, um, the question is, what is? I mean, there are two questions that that we can discuss. This one is, what could be the added value? And for sure, there are some. But what is the added value to focus only on only one concept and choosing that concept first of all? Uh, and second, what we have to take into account if we decided as a professional community or or, or in our organization to use that? Because once that we use to something, of course, we lost the rest, right? The rest around. And this and it's exactly what the um, planetary health discourage, because planetary health comes uh, promoting systemic thinking, systemic thinking of complexity. That means trying to look at the relationship of diverse experiences and, the, and diverse factors also, uh, and trying to have this kind, to connecting the dots to have the, the, the full picture. Um, and I think that uh, one, concept that it reminds even if it is not exactly the case but if the fact that eco anxiety reminds us uh, a clinical term so the clinical work that of course is could is part of mental health and mhpss right the, the bottom of uh, the top of the pyramid of services but but uh, is only one aspect and and so again because we saw inequities, we saw how and we know how climate change and other phenomenal environmental degradation affect communities, eco-anxiety just excludes all that. So we are risk to put all our efforts that are of, of, of course needed uh, on one aspect on the, at the individual level. Uh, but probably I'm also biased and I acknowledge that because my background is social psychology, why not? That's why I'm really open to, to discuss it and not to say that there is something wrong because actually it's not wrong. Uh, the problem is how we are building exactly in those time that we are facing uh, the climate change and MHPSS community as we are doing today, starting uh, reflecting, right? And discussing about that, how we are going to build a, a sort of new or quite new uh, illness narrative. Because in mental health, it's clear for me 
it's very clear that uh, it's a matter of uh, um, how we build the social construction of illness narrative, right? It's not something that it exists out there, it's how we as a professional, we make sense of an experience, right? Um, even trauma, or anxiety, whatever. So now how we decide uh, doing, let's say, a, a step beside uh, to, to build and to agree on the tools that we and our colleagues and we are going to use to face climate change. I hope it was clear. Yeah, I see another hand rise, please. Yes, yes. Um, go ahead, Ankima. I observe that there are some participants from Trinidad and Tobago. I would like to know if there is anything going on in this field that you all would like to mention in this meeting. The question is for colleagues from Trinidad and Tobago? Well, if you could answer that, what's going on in Trinidad and Tobago, fine. And if they could- No, I know. cannot. <laughs> no, no, I, <laughs> I, I cannot. I don't know the region. That's why, as I said, I'm very interested to, to know from, from your countries. Let's start from there, please. If anyone want to take the floor and to react uh, to see how those concepts that could make sense or no, or could be useful or not in, in your country and in your work, or, or if you are used to other kind of concepts and tools and intervention. I'll try. I will try my very best. Um, okay, so for the concept of MHPSS, um, you know, we've been operating a technical working group from since 2020. Um, and that, I think, has brought a number of state and non state actors together um, during the COVID 19 pandemic. However, um, in 2019, we had um, an earthquake in Port of Spain, and I think uh, we started thinking about disaster preparedness, um, albeit kind of um, shelved for a little while because of the COVID-19. Um, but I think the discussions are now coming to the fore in terms of how we prepare for um, things that we have been um, experiencing in terms of flooding in areas that previously never flooded, um, landslides that are happening inland and, and, and those things. So the discussions are happening and we have um, colleagues on this call from um, uh, like the Trinidad and Tobago Association of Psychologists, etc., who are looking into um, anxieties around climate change and how people are responding and whether people are anxious about it in the Caribbean. Because I think if uh, um, generally you're not in the midst of experiencing some of these crises, it seems far away. Um, but our job is to bring it, especially as mental health professionals, is to um, get people to start thinking about the what ifs. Um, and if it did happen, how would we cope? What kind of um, community resilience we would have? What aspects would be triggered or not triggered? Um, and just kind of thinking, you know, how do we keep the business of the country continuing amidst all of these changes? Um, hopefully that answers your question. But as a matter of fact, may I just add to that? My question leads into what would we put into a toolkit for climate change? To me, there are, there are different pockets of people speaking about climate change in Trinidad, but I feel it's not unified enough so that I want to know now so that I could begin the talk. In my little community where there are schools or people generally, when people come to clean my yard, I ask them, do you know about climate change? They don't. So what do we put into a toolkit for these people or for climate change so that everybody gets to know about climate change? David Zebri, could you answer? 
for me, please. Yes, I wish and uh, I try, but probably not in the way you're expecting, in the sense that uh, this kind of toolkit, uh, um, I mean, in terms of data and, and whatever about uh, what climate change is, so not related to mental health, but there's a phenomenon out there, uh, we have a lot, right? There are many, many uh, resources, um, starting from the more scientific uh, ones with the scientific language of the IPCC, the like the last report a few days ago, um, to the more friendly, friendly uh, information. But then data is not always the, as we saw also for other kind of health prevention or, or and social behavioral change, um, we saw it also with the COVID, is not always the only way that is meaningful for everyone. And so it's not the only way to to to, um, uh, to explain that and to, to sensibilize that. So I think that the most important thing is not... Uh, in my experience, because I have this discussion so often with with um, with some colleagues, and uh, and uh, uh, it's not about how to convince people or or, or how to make them aware, uh, but really how we can start uh, processes of listening to them, um, and then uh, I'm sure that uh, we can find because unfortunately it happens everywhere that uh, some changes in the local environment maybe not directly related to the climate change but it could be an entry door anyway uh, are, are, are exist and so the ones that they speak about what is changing in their own landscape in their own community etc then we can build on that but for me the point is not to tell people about climate change, but to listen people about climate change, even if they don't use that uh, concept of climate change, uh, but they, uh, I mean, it, it depends on each uh, community and, and people and health literacy, et cetera, et cetera, right? But re mm -hmm. really it's a process of listening. And that's why uh, at, at least uh, I, I speak uh, with the, about the experience in my own organization. Uh, when uh, when uh, even my manager say, okay, so what are we going to do now? Which kind of interventions? Okay, but we need once more, as always in MHPSS, actually to listen first and to to know better. Mm -hmm. And it's something that is a, is a really a step that we skip, I think. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe we can begin in our own homes to communities, our own homes first. By giving little examples now, so that you, you said, I mean, we shouldn't speak out, but we should listen. But if we begin something, you know, I'm saying for me, for people to know about climate change, I think they have to be educated about it. They have to be told. But if we, we use little examples, then instead of going so far out there, we can begin it within our own homes so that it spreads. We are, once we begin to live something, we can adapt a little better. I'm thinking, I'm hoping examples of climate change would come from within us, our homes. That's just it, together with what you've said. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, before we go to the hands, we have one question from the chat. Have there been any attempts to engage with non-health sectors at specific time timeframes to raise more awareness around efforts to address climate change. For example, around carnival time, there's a lot of pollution that ex exacerbates environmental problems. For you, David? Yeah, it, it happens uh, um, more and more, first of all, among uh, different health sectors. So, because as mental health, uh, um, Professional, uh, we are not always actually listening, <laughs> even if the MHPSS has, has, has now uh, very clear worldwide, let's say, but it's not always true that uh, is uh, well um, listened in, in all uh, professional communities. So first of all, there is this, uh, this uh, transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary dialogue between mental health and the other sectors of health, right? Um, that is not always easy. And then between health and non-health and why um, and where, but for, for example, um, with uh, with um, I mean I'm I'm speaking about the humanitarian work, but for example, with colleagues in my own organization working on uh, livelihoods and basic needs, for example, or disasters in my own organization, disaster risk reduction, 
uh, is, is a different direction than health and planetary health and, and, and wash is another aspect. So the idea is, and what is we are doing uh, at all level is really to work together, not only in our uh, uh, own uh, sector um, and direction. That is not easy because maybe we don't have the same goal. Maybe we don't use always the same language. Um, and, uh, and sometimes it's different to translate, even when we agree and we find common ground, but then how are we going to explain that to the donors, for instance? So, but it's the only way that we have to really take all the complexity that I uh, quickly showed before and that the planetary health take into account. So it's so complex that we cannot uh, just uh, uh, act at one point in that pathway in a time. So we really need a, a new partnership uh, with, with other sectors really to work on different aspects. Uh, for example, if we work on the prevention of non-communicable disease, we can work on, uh, on the health system, on the impact of the health system, on access to the health system, but also on, on the food chain, on the green areas, because we know that air pollution and physical activities are determinants of non-communicable disease. So just to show that there are so many aspects, so we really need, first of all, a theory of change for as much complex as possible, and then to highlight which kind of pathways are the most important and which one we can take all, but trying to have more entry door at the time, not just uh, having the idea, is not what you're saying, but just to be clear, not to having the idea and having and limiting M MHPSS at uh, um, healing after that something happened, of course. So, but really to, to intervene at different uh, parts and moment in this process. Thank you very much. Very interesting. And I know we still have a lot of questions, but time is with us, we have to move on. Anybody with questions, they can send it to us and we will send it to the presenter and we yeah. answer it in our newsletter. So David, your final words for us to move on. Thank you. Yeah, I, first of all, I, yeah, I really engage in, in, in answering and continue the, the conversation even uh, by mail. Uh, and then uh, um, just two things at the end that uh, uh, we need uh, as MHPSS professionals to continue because we are already doing many of us working with community, especially when coming to climate change and by uh, and environmental degradation and that we in parallel to healing and caring we really need to focus to aiming social change. And the final thing is that we, it's the opportunity also for us and the challenge to expand the MHPSS um, field also in terms of activities uh, and, to, and to try and to test and to experiment new, new activities. I mean, the question is gardening or, 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 or working on green areas and reforestation, et cetera, is MHPSS activities? It could be part of. So um, it doesn't mean that MHPSS is everything as MP is MHPSS. I don't say that, but that MHPSS for climate change is a complex endeavor. So we we really really try to to innovate, working with communities for social change. Thanks. Thank you. Over to you, Michelle. All right. Thank you very much, Alicia. Thank you so much, David. This was. This was rich, and you could see from the um, the questions and the comments that were coming through the through the, the chat that people were very, very, very interested in what you were saying and very moved to to connect what you were saying to our own experiences in our various parts of the world. So, thank you very much. Um, there were a couple of things that came up in the chat. Uh, there were there are a couple of um, queries about whether or not the slides would be available, and I think I get the sense that you said yes. Uh, and um, there, there certainly was an invitation from Peter Weller, and he, he put a link there about an upcoming forum. And he, he says, given the intersectability, sorry, um, between culture, belief, and behavior, it, there, the, there is a link that he shared that he feels would be of, of use and interest to us here, given our uh, topic area. So I would encourage people to look at that. Uh, thanks again, Davide. I think I could, I will sum up what you, all the things that you said today in one line that you um, had in one of your slides as a reminder. And it says, our work, our work basically as MHPSS agents is to transfer, uh, trans, transfer, sorry, 
despair and stasis into care and action. And I think that is the essence of what uh, we are doing here and what we really needed to hear from you. Uh, so thank you to everybody. Just a reminder, going back into the chat, the, the, the chat would have in it links to uh, the registration, uh, links to registering for the newsletter, registering for MHPSS COP, and uh, certainly the exit survey, which we are very interested in, in hearing from people, um, their, their feedback, their views, and I think the contact information from people. So we encourage you to go to the, the chat and to do the exit surveys and the, 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 um, the surveys and the questionnaires that are there that are relevant to us here today. That being said, I want to thank everyone for coming. I know we have people from all over the world. We appreciate the, um, sitting in the space with us. Uh, we thank everyone for coming. We thank all of the people who hosted here today. And to you, Davide, we can't say thank you enough. This was rich. This was stimulating. This was uh, interesting. This was very much what we needed to hear today. And we may have to have you back in this space to hear some more. So thanks very much uh, to everyone. Well, Thank you as well, uh, Michelle, for, for facilitating this uh, today as, as brilliant as usual. <laughs> Uh, and thank you, Davide, for, for your time. I just want to stress uh, to the whole group here the importance of the exit survey. It's not only the, a survey, but it's also a registration link where you are going to be able to get our updates. As well, it will be the only way we will be able to reach you to share these slides. So if you don't do that, we, we won't find a way to find you. <laughs> thank you so much again. and um, and. Uh, Great, very great to have everyone. Bye for now. <laughs>